when we look and we thought about it, you know, it's, we couldn't see a path for the company to be successful, a credible one, without the open source to be successful. And then once we reached a conclusion, we just, there was no other discussion. We just focus on that. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Today, I'm talking to Jan Stoika, who is maybe best known as the original CEO of Databricks, the company behind Spark. But recently, he's also started another incredibly successful company called Anyscale, which makes the open source project Ray. On top of all that, he's a professor at Berkeley where he runs the fascinating and super successful Rise Lab, which is responsible for many of the most exciting startups of the past decade. This is a super fun conversation, and I really hope you enjoy it. I think a lot of people listening to this will know about Ray and know about Anyscale, but for someone who's working in machine learning but doesn't know about um, any scale, what does it do? So fundamentally, if you look at the trends, the demands of the new kind of application, like machine learning applications or uh, data applications, are growing much faster than capabilities of a single node or a single processor. And this is even if you consider specialized hardware like GPUs, TPUs, and so forth. Uh, and therefore, it looks like there is no way to support these workloads other than distributing these workloads. Now, writing distributed application is hard. And now, if more and more applications are going to become distributed, there is an increased gap between the desire of people to scale up their workload by distributing it and the expertise the typical programmer um, uh, has. So Ray, actually, let me start with Ray before Databricks. It's the goal and is to make writing distributed application much easier. And is doing that both by presenting a very flexible and minimalist API. And in addition to that, we have this very strong ecosystem of libraries, distributed libraries. Mm -hmm. And many of the, you know, uh, the people in the audience probably know, like RLE, reinforcement learning, uh, QNI parameter tuning, more recently SERP, but also we have a lot of other third party li libraries, like XGBoost, Horobot, and so forth. Because at the end of the day, if you look at the most popular languages like Java or Python, they are not the most successful because they are the best languages. That's debatable. Uh, but they are very successful because they have a strong ecosystem of libraries. And developers love libraries because if you have a libraries for your particular application or workload, you make a few API calls and you are done instead of writing thousand lines of code. Now, this is Ray, it's open source. So at uh, any scale, it's a um, cloud offering, hosted offering of Ray. Uh, we are committed to build, uh, you know, the best platform to develop, deploy and manage Ray applications, okay? So this means higher availability, better, um, uh, better security, um, auto-scaling functionality, uh, tools, um, uh, monitoring when you deploy application in production. And on the developer side, we have this, we try to provide the developer the illusion of uh, or experience of an infinite laptop, right? Because still most of the developers, and we've done this survey and others have done surveys, most of the machine learning developers still are loving their laptop and they are still doing a lot of things on their laptop. Um, and we want to preserve the experience of working on a laptop using the same kind of tools like editors and things like that. But now we want to extend that to the cloud. So you edit, you do everything on your laptop, but then when you run it, you can run it in the cloud, we package the application, all the dependencies, we ship to the cloud, and we run on the cloud, we auto-scale. So it's pretty much transparent. So this is what Anyscale provides it. But both Anyscale and 
Ray are really targeting to make scaling the applications, uh, in particular machine learning applications, as easy as possible. So that's a, that's I guess very conceptually simple, but clearly, you know, it's been a problem for a very long time, and you've put a lot of work into to Ray and EddyScale. What makes it actually challenging to make a simple distributed framework? <laughs> that's that's a great question. You know, one lesson we learn is that actually people and developers, what they really prioritize, it's in some sense uh, performance and flexibility, even over reliability. And uh, yeah, I'll give you some examples. Um, when we started Ray, we have only tasks. Uh, they are side effect free. Tasks get some inputs from some storage, compute on that input, and then the result is also stored in this kind of storage, right? And then another task can consume. Now, that's a very simple model. And you can build a very robust system on that. This is from the lessons we learned also in, in the past with uh, Spark. Because if something, for instance, um, you lose some data, you can keep the lineage, which means the chain of tasks which created the data in the first place. And then you can re-execute the task if you know the order. And if the tasks are effect-free and they are deterministic, you get the same output. So you're pretty happy about that. But then people, you know, and uh, started to want more performance. And here where things started to fall apart. Like for GPUs, you don't want to just run a task, get the data in and store the data. Because even transferring the data from the RAM, from the memory of the computer on the GPU memory, in the GPU memory, it's expensive. And then if your task also is doing this like TensorFlow and, and starting it, you know, initializing all the variables, it takes a few seconds at the least, if more actually. So this kind of overhead was kind of starting to be prohibited. So people ask for, okay, I want my state actually to remain on the GPU, but then you don't have this kind of pure tasks. Mm. And now it's much harder to provide this kind of very nice model of fault tolerance, right? And then there is another thing, uh, reinforcement learning. So people using reinforcement learning, they wanted to use now for simulations or for rollouts, games, mm -hmm. right? It, and some of the games are not open source. And for these games which are not open source, they keep the state in, inside, you know, it's, it doesn't provide you the state, right? You cannot extract the internal state. You can only see the screen, right? You know, they make you take an action, moving left, right, and then you look at the screen and you, you know, you, you read the screen. So because of this, we have to get the actors. And um, now with actors, it was much harder to provide uh, kind of this fault tolerance. We still tried it initially. In our first paper, so we tried to be very smart. We said, okay, it's Python. So now we make the assumption that inside each uh, this kind of actors, you have a single thread, right? So you sequentially. So basically you, you can, all the method which are executed on the actor, you can then sequentialize. You have an order, you, you record the order, and then you can re-execute on the constant state. But guess what? People started to use multi-threading, right? And even if it doesn't work greatly in Python, they still use it. You cannot stop them. So then we are thinking, okay, we are going to simplify it, and let's simplify our life, because we still want to make a system which is kind of, you know, we, we want to understand it better and we want to try to provide some fault tolerance. And we, the first, we, we have this restriction that you, if you create an actor, only the party which creates the actor can invoke method on that actor, mm -hmm. right? So you have only one source. So at least, again, it's easier to serialize the actions. Mm -hmm. But then people started to want, oh, I want to do something like parameter server. And parameter server, I want to not only me 
to access this parameter server, which can be implemented as a bunch of actors, but others. So you need to pass the actor handles. But now you have, again, it's like this, you know, very concurrency from different methods submitted by different other actors or, or tasks. So all of these things, you know, is like adds, in some sense, complexity. Uh, and then, you know, if you talk about the fault tolerance, and I'm coming back to the fault tolerance because still it's important especially in a distributed system. It's uh, Leslie Lamport, the guy who did Paxos and Turing Award winner. His definition long time ago of a distributed system, it's a system in which when a machine or a service you never heard about fails, the system stops working, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> um, and, you know, then we have to give up our ideal transparency and flow tolerance. And we said, okay, you, you know, we can restart the actors, but then, you know, the application has to do some work in uh, restoring the state if it, if it cares about. In a, in a distributed system, these are the scarce things. It's a performance and fault tolerance. In general, concurrency is, a, is the other thing, right? It's because things happen in parallel and it's on different machines now. And again, when you expose and you want to make it flexible, things are much harder. Because in something like Spark, you abstract away the parallelism. So you don't give control of, to the user to write really parallel application. So then you have more control. Um, but again, the more you, you know. So it, this does seem very similar to Spark in some ways. I assume that this was informed yeah. by your experience with Spark. Could you maybe talk about what was happening? Like maybe first describe Spark in contrast and then yeah. talk about how that informed Ray. So totally. So Spark was developed for data parallel applications. So with Spark, as you as a programmer, you see the control sequence is sequential. You write like a program. The difference is that one of these instructions now in Spark on API, what happens under the hood is going to work on a data set. And that data set, whether it's the first was resilient distributed data sets, now it's data frame, is partitioned with different partition on different machines. So you have a data set and it's partitioned on different machines. And now you are going to execute a command on this data set. And that command is going to execute in parallel on each partition under the hood, right? Mm -hmm. But when you write a program, you just operate on the data set and you apply some function, right? And between, and, and it's, it's the computation model, which is called this bulk synchronous processing, is basically operate on stage. Each stage have a bunch of basically identical computation uh, operating on different uh, partition on the same data. And between stages, you exchange data. Right? You can do shuffle and so forth. So you create another data set for the next stage to operate on. Right? Mm -hmm. The basic stages is map and reduce. Right? So it's mm -hmm. kind of synchronous, right? It's like one stage operates on a data set, you do a shuffle to create another data set, you have another stage, and another stage, and another stage. From the programmer, you don't have control on parallels because you just you write one instruction and the instruction granularity is at the data set level. Mm -hmm. It's only under the hood you take that instruction or function and you execute on different uh, partition. So this is very it's, it's great for data, and obviously Spark has a great API for fantastic API for the data. Um, now Ray is much lower level. Ray exposes parallelism. Spark abstracts away parallelism. With Ray exposes parallelism, so you can actually say, you know, this task is going to operate on this data and this task on this data, this is going probably to happen in parallel. And here are the dependencies between the outputs of this task, right? And you have another task operating on these outputs from these different tasks. And, and, and that, again, gives you flexibility, but it's harder to program, right? On the other hand, in Spark and in other systems, you have a master, and this master is the only one which runs tasks because it launches all the tasks in a stage, right? And the stage. Like, for instance, in the case of Ray, a task can start other tasks or can start actor. They can't communicate between themselves. Mm -hmm. um, um, in, right, in the case of 
Spark and the other BSP systems are tasked in the same stage. They cannot communicate between each other, right? Mm -hmm. They just work on their partition. And then how the changes are propagated, you shuffle to create another data set for the next stage. But for humans, it's hard to write parallel programs. We are used to sync sequentially. Even context switching for humans is hard, right? And context switching, by definition, is not necessarily that we do things in parallel. It's multitasking, right? You do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and that's, even that is hard. Mm -hmm. So we are not used to sync parallel. This is difficult. This is hard. So that's why another reason for the libraries, because the libraries on top of Ray, they also abstract away parallelism. If you use RLlib or if you use uh, Tune, you don't need you don't know, you know, what is running where, and you don't need to worry about that. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of the, 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 the thing. So it's a, it's a much more flexible, lower level API. You know, I'm joking that if Ray will deliver on the promise, which I hope delivers, and you develop Spark today, you'll develop Spark on top of Ray. Mm. And that's that was going to be my next like question. Others. That's great. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that, that's exactly, you know, the way it is. Because Ray fundamentally, you know, another way to look at it, what it is, it's a RPC framework. This is remote procedure calls, plus an actor framework, plus an object store, which allows you to efficiently um, pass the data between different function and actors mm. by reference, right? That's what it is. Instead of always copying it, we just pass the references. That's, that's it, right? So that's... You know that's why where the flexibility comes from. When you when you were working on Databricks or Spark, were there use cases that you were seeing that made you want to develop Ray, or was it like something that <laughs> yeah. you always wanted to create? That's a, no, no, no. That's that's you know one thing happened, and I'm believer in this. You should develop a new system. You know the existing systems do not provide the functionality you need. And before you develop this new system, you better try to implement what you want on the existing systems, right? So, sure. and when we developed Ray, it was in, in 2015, I believe in fall, I taught a class, uh, I was a graduate class. I was still CEO of Databricks at that time. And uh, uh, and Robert and Philip took that, took that class. It was a system class, your machine learning student. So their project, was about uh, data parallel training. And obviously, I asked them, okay, you, you Spark for that. You know, mm -hmm. it's good. So they did use Spark. And actually, you know, they modify a little bit. They call the chain, you know, the modification SparkNet. But then there are a few challenges, right? You know, Spark was too rigid. And with reinforcement learning, the computation model you need is like much more complex, so to speak. You need you know, um, nested parallelism and things like that. And so Park, you know, was, again, was too rigid. It was fantastic for uh, data processing. But now you need a lot of more flexibility for something like reinforcement learning. It, it wasn't a good fit. It's like, yeah. And, and the other thing, uh, Spark, is that it's um, in Java, JVM is Scala. And it didn't, at least that, time very good support for gpus so the, and that's why they started to, to develop ray but again robert and philip developed something for themselves mm. to start right that's great um i mean i i also would love to hear the story of um spark because i remember a time when you know, Hadoop had the same value prop and everyone was really excited about it. And it seemed like <laughs> Spark replaced it in such a massive way that I think you rarely see um, with technologies. I, I'd love to hear yeah. what the use case was that yeah. drove the development of Spark and why you think the yeah. switch happened so quickly. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> um, so the story there, it's also started from a class project. This was in 2009, uh, in spring. I was teaching this class about, again, it was graduate, you know, graduate class. And it was cloud computing services and applications, something like that. And again, at that, one of the projects was to have cluster orchestration. The problem was you want on the same cluster to be able to run multiple frameworks. So to share the same cluster across different frameworks. 
one use case, it was actually upgrading because Hadoop at that time was not very backward compatible. So now you have a new version. It was a big deal to upgrade it. Most of the de development deployments are on-prem. So now it's hard on-prem to come up with another cluster to test the new version before you are going to move to the next version. So therefore, if you have the ability to run two uh, Hadoop uh, versions side by side on the same cluster, this would be a much, much better uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, a great value proposition at that time. Initially, the system was called Nexus, but then someone told us from Academia that this is a bad name because they all use a name. So it's a name conflict. So it changed it to Mesos. Maybe some of the people may remember about Apache Mesos, and that was yep. a precursor of Kubernetes. So, and, and on this project, there are four people. Um, it was Matei Zaharia. It was um, Andy Konvinsky, Ali Gorsi, and uh, uh, Ben Hidman. With Mesos, um, one of the value proposition, you have all this framework, and it's going now to make it easier to build a new framework, data framework on top. Right? Because Mesos will take care about you know, some isolation between the frameworks and doing some heavy lifting about detecting the uh, failures, things like that, doing some scheduling. You'll see that Spark, one of the reasons was developed to show as a showcase for Mesos, because now it's easier writing a few hundreds of lines of code to develop a new framework like Spark and, and do it and, and run it on Mesos. So this was happening in mid-2009. So what are the use cases? The primary use case was machine learning. It's, it's a great story there. It's, um, that was Rad Lab, and then was Amp Lab, and then Rice Lab. Each lab is more like five years, where um, everyone, you know, people from different disciplines were sitting together, the same open space, meaning machine learning, databases, system people, all, all together. And it was around that time was also this Netflix challenge, the prize. You remember it's $1 million prize for developing the best recommendation system. It was, we had a postdoc, Lester, come to us to say, okay, it's a lot of data. What we, keep, what we, what we should do, you know, what, what, what can you use? you use? You are the system guys. Tell us what should we use. Well, you should use Hadoop, right? You are working with Hadoop. And, okay, that you know, Lester went and used Hadoop, we, tell, we shown him up to use. But then he comes back and say, well, this is super slow. It analyzes a big data. It doesn't run out of memory, but it's so slow. And obviously it was slow because most of the machine learning algorithms are iterative in nature, right? You start, you ingest more data, you refine the model, you know, you up and until, you know, you get a model, you are satisfied with the accuracy, right? It converges, right? <laughs> each of these iterations was translating in a MapReduce job. And each MapReduce job was reading and writing the data from the disk. And at that time, the disk was slow uh, disk drives, right? So it took forever. So that was one, one of the use cases. The other use cases was query processing. Also at that time, what happened, everyone, at least some large companies were adopting Hadoop to process large amount of data. Um, after all, it's MapReduce. Google was doing MapReduce. Must be good. But now you have also these other people, like database people, and they are, you know, looking at the queries, the data, and so forth. But now you have all these other huge data with somewhere else, and they're asking for access to the data. He said, okay, you get access to the data. The only thing you need to do is write this Java code, right? It's MapReduce code, right? And you can process the data. These people, you know, that was not what they were doing. They were doing SQL, right? Writing SQL statements. And then people starting developing um, Hive, or I think Facebook and Pig Latin from Yahoo, a layer on top of Hadoop, which provides some query language, which is similar to SQL. Mm -hmm. So you get that. So you have this system. Okay, now you can do the query on it. The problem when you do a query on that, these people are coming from databases. They write the query, they get the answer. Here you write the query, well, you know, come in two hours back to get some answer. So it was slow. So this is, these are kind of use cases Spark uh, targeted. And the way targeted that for keeping as much as possible the data set in memory. Hmm. 
right? And the trick which Park had at that time, not only to keep the data in memory, but how do you ensure resilience, right? Fault tolerance. Mm -hmm. Because that was a big deal, right? You know, if you remember all of these things about actually even building big computers, clusters from commodity servers, it's coming actually from Berkeley. It was a project which was called NOW, Network of Workstations, in the 90s. Before that, you want a lot of power and so forth, you buy a supercomputer. Mm -hmm. But now you have this kind of commodity servers, guess what? They fail. So this kind of a very ingrained, you need to provide fault tolerance. That's why Hadoop is put the data on the disk. If it's on the disk, hopefully it's durable because it was creating three copies of each data. So you take care of that, right? But in case of Spark, now you keep the data in memory. So how do you do fault tolerance? And you do fault tolerance like I discussed earlier, because you have only tasks. The tasks, they don't have side effects. You keep the lineage of task, you recall that. And if something fails, you re-execute the task, which created the data you lost because of the failure. Mm -hmm. So that was the spark. So now, because now the data is in memory, machine learning applications are going to run much faster, right? Because between iterations, you know, the data is still in memory, right? And by the way, it was also more flexible as a computation model because Hadoop has only map reduced to stages. But here you can have chain a lot of more stages, right? And obviously, if the data is in memory, the queries are going to return much faster, even if you have to scan the entire data, which is in memory. These are kind of the use cases which powered Spark. And now you are saying, you are asking, okay, how is it displaced? You see, Hadoop, in some sense, it was a lot of hype for good reasons. But it was still in the bubble. You know, in 2000, it, it's quite amazing because everyone was, at least on the tech world, knew about Hadoop and big data. The number of companies like in 2012, 2013, that period, there were not a lot of companies using Hadoop. The summits, Hadoop uh, summit, were like, you know, 300, 500 people, maybe 700 people. Uh, so it was kind of, it's like bubble. And then Spark came into that bubble and it says, we are going to provide a better computation engine. And we are going to work because Hadoop has two parts, the computation engine, which is map reduced, and HDFS, which is distributed file system. And initially, actually, it was a fight because initially, not a fight, but it was, today was viewed for a long time that it's only can operate with small data which fits in memory, mm. right? But when it started, it wasn't anything difficult to operate on the data on the disk, and Ray was actually doing that for from day one but the focus on in memory, because that was what was doing particularly well, um, then it was a very smooth replacement because it was now another engine in the same ecosystem. And then Cloudera bet on it in 2013 at the end. And then it's, it's uh, snowballed from there. Was it obvious that there was an opportunity to start a company around Spark? So initially, you know, you, we built this park and it was an academic project and people started to use it. And the obvious question was, well, from a company, am I going to bet? I like Spark, but can I bet on it? What happens when Matei or whoever, you know, graduate? Mm -hmm. What happens in the project? So we really wanted to have an impact, right? Because we saw this as a much better way to do data processing. We saw that data is a big problem. And there are two ways to, do, to go about it, right? You need eventually to have a company behind the open source in, to make open source a viable uh, solution, at least for large organizations. And actually, I'm not going to give names, but we went to a Hadoop company. And we were friends with Cloudera, Hortonworks, and so forth, even Mapar. We knew people. They were actually sponsors of our lab at Berkeley. We were meeting all the time. And we asked, actually, you know, don't you want to take over Park, but they didn't because there are other plans about what will come after Hadoop map reduce, you know, as a computation engine. And then it, you know, it just happened times aligned. You know, I was about to take a leave, um, I take graduating, and all the other people, there are other, you know, um, Andy and uh, Patrick already thinking about creating a company. So it's all coming together, and we say, okay, let's start a company. 
And we had uh, a lot of discussion on the startup company. And one of the big questions is company success predicated on the Spark success, open source success. Because remember, when we started, things are not very clear. We started in 2013. We started to talk about the company in the fall in 2012. And when you look around, you have Linux, which is kind of pretty special phenomenon. But then if you look at that time, there was no unicorn based on open source. It was MySQL, but, you know, only later was sold to uh, Oracle. And Cloudera wasn't big yet? Uh, uh, Cloudera was not big enough. Uh, Hortonworks was small. Um, it wasn't big enough. It's only one or two years after we started, we have this kind of big round of, you know, the valuation of four point something billions. Also, Cloudera was pivoting, actually, they were cloud era because they were, they initially they wanted to do in the cloud, but they saw that it's not enough business in the cloud, and probably it was true then, and then pivoted and on, on-prem, right? So, so and, and then, you know, we started the company, but long story, we decided to go to, at that time, with this new business model. We only provide the hosted version of Spark on the cloud, initially only AWS. We decided that the success of the open source is necessary to the success of the company. We are saying, okay, if the open source is going to be successful, then if we build the best product for the open source, hopefully we are going to get these customers, even if initially maybe there will be other open source uh, companies providing Spark or Cloud themselves, right? Because then Cloudera provided uh, Spark to their users, then Mapar, then Hortonworks, and obviously AWS and Azure, Microsoft with HD Insights. So we committed, we bet on the success of the open source back then. And we put, in each, we put a lot of effort in that. It seems like now businesses built on an open source model is a you know incredibly popular strategy for for infrastructure companies yeah do you but databricks I mean, yeah databricks was one of the first to do that right because before then it was on prem and that was a business model hmm. the business model on prem was a little bit heavier much heavier and remember that some companies founded at the same time they failed even if the open source would be huge or not failed, but they're not as successful as people believe. So it, it wasn't clear at all. I, I mean, that was at that time a pretty big bet and we got very hard pushback and a lot of pressure to go on prem, at least initially. Um, but yeah, so now building a hosted offering for an open source is quite common. Why do you think the popular deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch don't have something like that hosted in the cloud, even though enterprises, you know, generally use them, that business model doesn't exist there? It's very great. It's a great question. I, I, I can just, obviously, this is hypothesis, right? <laughs> uh, for PyTorch, we, you have grid, grid AI right now. Right, it's true. providing some of the hosted. Uh, but I think that these are coming from large companies, open sources from large comp- companies. And, and these companies themselves are not interested to monetize. Like, the way, for instance, probably Google, think about the TensorFlow, the monetization is that, you know, TensorFlow and everything will work best on uh, GCP, in particular using TPUs, and that's how they are going to monetize. So the best place to train TensorFlow models, which use TensorFlow, is going to be GCP. The same with Kubernetes. It's hard for a company which doesn't have the creators of the open source to create a business, you know, to, you know, it's hard, right? Because if you don't have creators of that particular open source, part of the company, then it's just harder, right? It, it just you, you cannot orchestrate, you cannot develop in sync the open source and the offering. I, I'm not aware about a huge success so far of a company behind Kubernetes. But again, how can you do that? You know, most of the Kubernetes developers are still with Google. So I think that's it, it has to have something to, to do with that. And the other thing is about 
the hosted offerings are more valuable when the solution is distributed, because then the value is to manage a cluster. As long as you run on only a single machine, the value is a little bit less, mm -hmm. right? Now, of course, TensorFlow can run on a bunch of machines and so forth, and this TensorFlow distributed. But I do think that these are the two things. One, most of the uses of PyTorch and TensorFlow are still on a single machine. And the second one, most of the developers of these open source libraries are still with these large companies like Google, Facebook. I may be wrong, and that's but that's kind of I would think are the differences. At least these are some differences. Interesting. I guess another question I want to ask you, as someone who's started these two very very successful companies, do you think that the humans you picked as co-founders had anything to do with that? Was there something that you, you saw in them or some, you know, commonalities between the co-founders that you picked that you think made them effective? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know that, Lucas, you know, the people are so important, right? I mean, I, I'm telling everyone if I'm the things I'm the most proud of at Databricks, and I'm saying Databricks because, you know, it's older companies, so you can see uh, I have, it's, it's a more of time to observe. I'm proud of the original team. And at some point, you know, to be successful, you need everything, right? Including being lucky, right? Um, but I think that people were quite complementary. They have all, despite the fact they have a lot of accomplishment, relatively low ego. Um, we are very open and we are a team like Matei, I know, you know, I know him 2006, seven when he joined Berkeley. Uh, Ali came to Berkeley in 2009, uh, and he was also there at that time, then Patrick. So we knew each other for a long time. We were together. We are very open in discussing any issues. And we are not always agreeing. We have shouting matches and so forth. I remember that, you know, later people told us that this small office in Berkeley, and we didn't realize but when we are having this kind of very passionate exchange exchanges, people are hearing almost everything because there are not good in isolation, right? It's like, <laughs> um, it was um, at some level scary, right? Because you have these people who are supposed to lead the company and they don't agree on even probably basic things, but you are very comfortable uh, debating. And I think that the same it's, you know, is Robert and Philip at any scale. It's again low ego and so forth. And I think that one thing you want from anyone, from everyone, including the CEO and so forth, they want you want everyone to put the success of the company above what everyone's goals are. Right? Because yeah, what what is that what is a say? There is no winner in a losing team, right? Right. So so I think this is um this is what I would say. You know, you need and when you know people for a long time, you have the trust, right? Trust is absolutely fundamental, right? Because there are good things and, you know, there are high and low points in the life of every company. So it's like I imagine always like a small company is like you have a plane which is flying very close to the ground, right? So you need to... <laughs> there is not a lot of room you have there. Um, I'm not saying that everyone is absolutely humble or whatever, but... Absolutely, they need to believe that the most important thing is the success of the company. When you set up Ray as a business, now you had been running Databricks for a while and it was starting to see real success. I imagine you were quite a different person. Did you think about starting that company differently than starting Databricks? You see, what strikes me, how much great feedback you get from people. And... How much of this feedback you ignore, right? If I think back, it's about, you know, fundamentals. Everyone, you know, knows and what you need, in, at least in theory, to do to, to build a great company, right? Of course, you, have, you need to have a great team. You need to have a vision, strategy. You need to really focus on the product market fit, right? It's like early customers, make them super successful, iterate from there. Um, so everyone, you know, it's like, you, you, you know, it's, you, you know how to do. 
But what strikes me is how hard it is to do. People don't do the wrong things because I don't think in general they don't know what is the right thing. They do the wrong things because doing the right thing is very hard. Imagine that you are going, you know, San Francisco, pick your favorite city, and you are going to ask passerby, what does it take to be successful? And what do people will say? You know, you need to work hard, focus, have a little bit of luck, things like that, right? Everyone will tell you what you need, you know, be driven, persistent, whatever they are, they are going to tell you, right? But you are going to get a lot of similar answers. So all of them actually know what it takes, but how many people do it? And the reason is just hard to do it, right? It's damn hard, right? And um, when I'm looking back, you know, there are some things which stick with that at Databricks. Like we, we pick the cloud. Why do you pick the cloud? Because it was focused, right? We wanted to focus on something. We realized early on that developing for cloud and for on-prem, it's a pretty different engineering process. So you need to come up with two teams. And we are not even sure that we can build a great engineering team doing one thing, let alone two. So, so, so things like that, right? Or we are, we are thinking that, okay, we are fine to do the cloud because we believe the cloud market is going to be big enough for us. If you tell me that the on-prem market is whatever, tens of billions or whatever, I don't remember at that time, what I can do about it. I have 40 people or 80 people. In order to capture any sliver of that market, it will take years. So why focus on that now? So this, these are the things, what I'm trying to say, we didn't do anything other than, in some sense, the basics. And, and the same thing with, with any scale. You, you try to, to focus where, where you want to innovate and the rest you just try to use the state-of-the-art solution. So now, how is different? It just, in some sense, makes you more confident that these basic things are working. It also makes you more sure, you know, approaching them is very rarely are shortcuts. It's just hard work, right? Mm -hmm. And then it makes you even more appreciate I didn't say so far, but it's probably the most important thing. It's about how important is execution. Mm -hmm. Like John Doyer was saying, is saying, right? It's like ideas are easy, execution is everything. It's again, and you get some people, it makes such a huge difference. Like Ron Gabrisco, who was eventually is our CRO. He joined us when the company was, you know, few millions IRR, took us, you know, many hundreds of millions now. So it's about having, or like with hiring, everyone is telling you back channel references are so important, right? But it's hard, right? Because it requires effort. Everything requires effort. So this is, I cannot unfortunately tell you, is it any silver bullet or anything? You know, it's just stick with the basics and think about there is no shortcuts. You also need to think that every company is different. It has to be different. If, it's a, if you think that it's the same, it's something probably is wrong. Because things change. Like, for instance, AnyScale versus Databricks. When we started Databricks, AWS was the biggest cloud. Right now, you have multiple clouds. You cannot ignore, you, you know, GCP or, uh, or Azure. You know, when we started Databricks, was data scientists, the main, you know, people we focus on, then data engineers and so forth. Here is more kind of developers and machine learning developers, right? So, and, 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 and different users obviously want different things. Again, it's nothing earth shattering, it's something obvious. But um, I think there are these little things, and, and then again, it's execution, it's speed. Was it hard? It's, it's funny, I'll just say, you know, I get asked that question a lot about second time company, what do you do differently? And I, I answered almost identically to you, where it's like you kind of know what you're supposed to do, but in the details, you kind of do yeah. little things better. But I, I'm kind of curious because one thing that's different about your experience than mine is, you know, the second time, you know, you're you're founding a, a company and a, you're not CEO that time. Was that, um, was it hard to work with um, Robert in some ways? I mean, he seems very impressive and smart, but I think it might be his first corporate job in his life. Yeah. Um, you must feel like, ah, I know how to do this and you're not doing it or, or did that not, did that not happen? 
No, I, I think, you know, um, the reason I've been a CEO at Databricks in early on, because no one, you know, want, was sure that he's going to do it long term. Right. But actually, Ali wanted to go to academia. Obviously, Matei had a job <laughs> at MIT, he was on, on, on leave and, and so forth. Um, with, with Robert and Philip, they, you know, they didn't look anything else. They didn't interview anything. This is what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, this arrangement right now, I really like it. And again, we, we worked together since 2000, whatever, 15. So, you know, four years before we started the company. So we know each other very well. It's again, I think that in terms of responsibilities, Robert, myself, and some degree, Philip, we divide it in pretty, pretty well. As you know, like as, as, as you know, there are so many things to do. You know, having someone you can rely and, you know, you can split some of the responsibilities helps out. That makes sense. Well, we're going slightly over time and we always like to end with two questions, which I'll do with you, but maybe I'll make the second to last one more specific. Is there another project like, like Spark or like Ray that you're dreaming of that you would do if you had more time? I think the one thing I'm looking, you know, looking now, and this could be another next lab at Berkeley. We are looking about uh, tentatively we call it like sky computing. It's multi-cloud, but think about internet for the clouds. Uh, fundamentally, the belief here is that what internet did, it stitched together a bunch of disparate networks and provides the abstraction of a single network. And therefore, when you send your packets, you don't know through which networks your packets travel. So I think that what we are going to see more and more will be a merging of this kind of layer we call the intercloud layer, which will abstract away clouds, right? Yeah. And you, you see the early science. You, 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 it will lead also to specialized clouds. You can think about, think about, for instance, you have a machine learning pipeline. You have data processing, you have uh, training, you have serving. Each of these components, you can actually run on different clouds for good reason. Like for instance, maybe you process confidential data and you want to remove the PII information from the data. You can decide to do that on Azure because it has Azure confidential computing. You can decide to do training on TPUs. And you can decide to do serving using Amazon inferential new chips. So, you, and you, I think you are going to see also the rise of more specialized clouds, especially for machine learning. Mm. There is an announcement from NVIDIA that is Equinox, which is, it's really like GPU optimized the data centers, right, to build. So I think that's kind of something very exciting. And you can see that again, like you look always at the trend and, you know, there are, is this kind of evolutions in which the clouds by necessity or driven by the open source provide more kind of similar services. Mm -hmm. And then this provides a, be a very good uh, ground for emerging the next level to abstract away. Wow, what, a, what an intriguing answer. It seems a little crazy, but I, I, I'm kind of convinced as you talk about it. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, you ask, you ask for it. So, um, so I, I, you know, I think there are many projects, but I think this is this is this is one. Uh, uh, I think you know it it will happen. And, and by the way, you know, with every company, with everything, probably you want, you need to take a bet, right? You need to make a bet, right? If you don't make a bet, you are doing what everyone else is doing, right? Right? You guys make a bet. What you are doing is absolutely not obvious when you start it. Yeah. This I can agree. be a great company, right? Totally. You have to. And if you are wrong, at least you try it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, right. let me usually we end with the question for ML researchers. We ask, what is the hardest part about getting a machine learning model into production? But I think for you, uh, you're a company builder, also an academic, but I think as a as a founder. <laughs> What is the hardest part that people wouldn't see from the outside about building a really successful big business? 
I think that probably the hardest thing, one of the hardest thing is that obviously with each company there are ups and downs. And I think that when things are down, you know, you may need to make correction and it can be down because a product doesn't deliver, maybe because you're on the wrong path with the product, maybe because the wrong people or I mean, not the best fit. Um, I think that when things go well, you know, it's easy, it's great, right? <laughs> uh, but I think there it's about always going back to fundamentals, trying to not be emotional and trying to always look at the facts, whether there are trends in industry, you look at the data, whether there are data coming from the customers, uh, whether there are facts with respect to someone who maybe is not the best fit. Because when things are hard or good, it's like we are humans, we are emotional. And I always found that it's hard to split and, and push the emotion to take second seat and try to be some, you know, to, to think only about facts when you take the decisions. The harder things are, the more emotional you are, right? Because you take it personally and think like that. So I think this is what I found the hardest thing. And I'm also an emotional person uh, at, at some degree. I'm getting also really excited. But that's kind of what I found because I found that in general, when you kind of try to make decisions based on the emotion, at least in my case, I think for some people it works, it's gut feeling and so forth. For me, it didn't work. Hmm. Do you have any tricks for kind of managing your emotions and thinking clearly under stress? I'm asking for Fred, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to simplify the problem. And there are many things coming when you are under stress. And I'm trying to say, okay, what is the most important thing? And try to forget about everything else. And then try to simplify the problem. And then it's easier to make a decision based on what is the most important thing. I, I, I think that's what I uh, dis discover, especially when it's very hard to make a decision because there are multiple dimensions associated with the decision. Like, like, for instance, I mentioned to you early on, we had a lot of discussion when we started Databricks. Okay, it's, it's, it's important for the data of open source to be successful because now we have a company. Now we, we need to build a product. We need to have some revenue at some point, right? And, you know, and ob obviously there are, you know, there are four possibilities, right? The open source is successful. The company is not successful. Open source successful. Company is successful. Good. That's good. You have all this kind of four two by two. And when you look and we thought about it, you know, it's, we couldn't see a path for the company to be successful, a credible one, without the open source to be successful. And then once we reached a conclusion, we just, there was no other discussion. We just focus on that. And yeah, it just try to find methods to simplify it and hope that everything else we didn't consider will follow up. As long as you are focusing on the main thing, everything else will follow up. That's my I'm trying to oversimplify it and sometimes maybe it's not good and try to think about what is the most important things I need to solve or awesome. what is the most important dimension. Well, that's good advice and a good spot to end, I think. Thank you very much. Okay. That was a fun interview. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Appreciate it. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out.